Keynote 048 was a randomized phase three trial that looked at the question of whether or not the use of pembrolizumab, a PD-1 inhibitor, in the first line treatment for metastatic recurrent head and neck cancer would advance survival. And the design was that um, the control arm was the old standard extreme regimen, uh, platinum, 5-FU infusion, and cetuximab. And the experimental arms were either pembrolizumab monotherapy or pembrolizumab together with chemotherapy. Recognizing that pembrolizumab monotherapy has a lower response rate than chemotherapy with cetuximab, there was also um, a biomarker-driven strategy for analysis of the trial where the um, cohorts of uh, patients who had high pdl one expression defined as a combined positive score incorporating tumor cell and immune cell staining of greater than 20, a combined positive score of greater than 1, those two biomarker-enriched subsets were analyzed first, and then the overall population uh, was analyzed. There's also uh, a secondary analysis of this paper looking at um, the CPS0 group and the CPS1 to 19 group, which were not prospectively defined uh, subgroups, and those will be presented at virtual AACR later in the month. But um, the primary analysis was taking each of those two experimental arms and comparing it to the standard of care arm in the biomarker-driven subsets in the overall patients. And this has been previously reported. It shows that um, pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy is superior to the extreme regimen for all patients, and that pembrolizumab is superior to chemotherapy and cetuximab in the pdl one expressing patients defined as CPS1 or higher, and is non-inferior in all comers. One of the, the interesting things about uh, the initial presentation of the Keynote 048 trial was that these very striking results were seen in overall survival, despite the fact that progression-free survival was not advanced by the use of first-line immune checkpoint in inhibition. And the um, question that arose then was, are there durable alterations in the tumor microenvironment or the uh, immune response to the malignancy that can affect how patients fare when they receive su subsequent lines of therapy. And so Kevin Harrington presented on, on behalf of um, the researchers involved in this trial, the um, results of an analysis looking at what was called progression-free survival two. And this was defined as the time from randomization to objective tumor progression on the next line of therapy or death from any cause. And so um, patients who did not receive uh, second-line therapy or who stopped second-line therapy without progression of disease and did not stop third-line therapy and did not start third-line therapy were counted as an event at the time of death if they died or they were censored at the time of the last known survival. And those patients who stopped second-line therapy with progression of disease were counted as an event at the time of progression. And those who stopped second-line therapy without progression and started third-line therapy were counted as an event at the start of the third-line therapy. And so the same um, biomarker-informed uh, analysis plan was used. So they um, looked first at pembrolizumab versus the extreme regimen in the CPS20 group. And here there was a significant advantage. The hazard ratio for PFS2 was 0.64. And the median um, time to second progression was 11.7 months with pembrolizumab compared with 9.4 months with um, whatever the standard of care second line therapy was that the patient was getting. And these, these uh, effects were durable. So at two years, 27% of the patients who had initially received pembrolizumab as compared to 12.5% of those who had initially received uh, cetuximab chemotherapy remained progression free. Looking next at the CPS1 population, um, here again, there was a benefit. And so the hazard ratio here for PFS2 was 0 0.8. The median went from 8.8 .8 to 9.4 months. And again, there was a big difference at 24 months. 22% of patients who had initially received pembrolizumab and 9.9% of those patients who had originally received the extreme regimen. Looking next at the total population who had been uh, initially treated on the pembrolizumab uh, alone experimental arm or the control arm. Here, the hazard ratio was 0 0.90, although the confidence intervals overlapped one. Uh, median was nine months for either of those two groups, and 24-month uh, rates were somewhat better for the patients who'd had initial exposure to pembrolizumab. Turning now to the pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy versus extreme, and starting with the CPS20 biomarker-enriched subset. Here, the hazard ratio for PFS2 was 0 0.63. 
and the uh, median went from 9.7 to 11.3 months. Again, big differences at two years, 28.9% of the um, Pembro plus chemo patients are still without PFS2 compared to 12% for the patients who had initially received the extreme regimen. CPS1, uh, again, a striking benefit to initial pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy. So PFS2 going from 8.9 to 10.3 months with a hazard ratio of 0.66. And um, in the total population, uh, a hazard ratio of 0.74 with confidence intervals of 0.62 to 0.88, median going from 9 to 10.3 months, and uh, more than a doubling in 24-month PFS2. So the... Um, the suspicion that we had when we saw that disconnect between PFS and OS in the original trial um, seems to be borne out by, these, by the data in the secondary analysis. It, it does appear that early exposure to pembrolizumab enhances um, the benefit of subsequent lines of therapy. Looking at what patients received as their subse first subsequent line of therapy, in the Pembro uh, monotherapy group, 49% of patients went on to get some other kind of anti-cancer treatment. 45% of the time that was more chemo, that was chemotherapy. 20% uh, of the time it was an EGFR inhibitor. Um, and about 2.5% of the time it was some other immunotherapy. And another 1% of the time it was other things. For Pembro plus chemo, um, 41% of those patients went on to get subsequent therapy, which included 31% of patients who had chemotherapy, 13% who had an EGFR inhibitor, 4% who had some kind of um, immunotherapy, and 3% who had something else. The extreme group was actually most likely to go on to subsequent lines of therapy, um, and they were most likely to get uh, what would have been the standard of care, say in the US at that time, for second line therapy with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. So 53% of uh, the extreme patients got at least some kind of uh, subsequent anti-cancer therapy, of which 34% was chemotherapy, 6% was an EGFR inhibitor. Um, obviously, they were just coming off cetuximab. 16.7% uh, was an immune checkpoint inhibitor, and 1% was other. So um, these uh, data do seem to substantiate the, the um, suspicion that we had from the original data presentation that early exposure to pembrolizumab across all of these patient groups enhances uh, the benefit of subsequent anti-cancer therapy.